Good morning, Portugal show, live stream and podcast. How are you this morning? Tudo bem? Como estás? Quite the morning this morning. Uh, we'll be talking to uh, Miguel Nunes Silva. And now I spoke to him, I think, a couple of years ago now. Uh, first of all, well, well, my, my, my main reason for speaking, well, the only reason for me speaking to him at the time was to learn more about the Portuguese political system. And uh, some way into the conversation, after he'd very um, brilliantly elaborated, elucidated, upon the Portuguese political system, helping us foreigners understand it a little bit better. I said, well, what's your political leaning then? Would you would you care to say? And, and very openly, he said, yeah, I'm a shaker. And um, I was quite shocked. I think my jaw dropped because of um, all the things I'd read about shaker and um, how I, I think I was um, conditioned to be uh, shocked and appalled by being in the company of such a person. And um, he's back this morning. Of course, after the um, election, it's not an election victory necessarily, is it? They didn't win-win, but they certainly uh, quadrupled their seats in Parliament and have become the kingmaker uh, they've been hoping to be over this last uh, five years uh, since they've really been in mainstream politics in Portugal. And so let's have a look, as it says on the screen now. Uh, let's see if the far right and extreme labels are justified. And let's bring conversation where there might be conflict and discussion where there might be division. That's a quality I think I've learned from the Portuguese. So I'm looking forward to a very interesting conversation with uh, Miguel at around nine this morning. Uh, this would ordinarily be the departure lounge with Mama Bear. She's been traveling. She may join us towards the end of the show this morning. Otherwise, we'll um, squeeze her in uh, another time. But some say, of course, um, um, around beyond where we're at with the febrile uh, t uh, temperature, situation, environment around politics. There are bigger moves afoot uh, cosmically. Uh, well, yeah, in society, we're in the fourth turning, perhaps, and uh, those of a spiritual dis disposition are suggesting that something bigger um, is occurring. So we might even we might even finish the show with, with a uh, with a chat with Mama Bear and Mama Bear McGowan about the bigger the biggest picture in which we find ourselves. As many, of course, are looking at the uh, smaller, the the micro and macro of economics. What about the bigger picture for humanity in this uh, interesting time for human beings? Uh, as the historical wheels turn, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And it looks like these times are rhyming with other times in history. And also we're in, in an evolutionary path, aren't we? Where, where might we go next as the politics that currently uh, we depend on that seem to be collapsing, um, seem to be witnessing uh, the uh, rise of populism, according to some uh, views and lenses on the matter. Uh, the, the systems that we are fighting for within politics seem to be uh, collapsing before our very eyes. The systems don't seem to be helping us especially well. And that's part of the political problem. So perhaps there's a bigger picture and maybe M. Mama Bear McGowan or you might like to talk about that towards the end of the show after we've had a chat with Miguel. How are you doing today? Before nine, uh, we've got quite a few things to look at, uh, including winning a house in Portugal. Um, this is not a, a, a Good Morning Portugal competition, but it's something that was brought to my attention by our friends Carl and Pretty, uh, who are with us uh, in the last few days. They live over in central Portugal, and uh, they were aware of this and told me about it, which I think is fascinating. You can win a Portuguese house in a raffle, and if you like Earthship-type architecture, if you'd like a country house in central Portugal, I think it's going to cost you around €23 Euros to enter. Uh, I'm not uh, endorsing it or not, as the case may be. I'm just telling you about it. I think it's fascinating, uh, the chance to win this uh, beautiful home. Uh, well, you can be the judge of whether you think it's beautiful or not. There are three prizes. There, there is this off-grid property in central Portugal. Yeah, key, key uh, um, 
description missed out earlier on there, Carl. Yes, the, it's an off-grid property. It's not only beautiful and earth-shippy, it's an off-grid property in central Portugal. And uh, your runners-up prizes are 20 litres of organic uh, cold-pressed olive oil and a third prize of 10 litres of organic cold-pressed olive oil. And the ticket price is, oh, 29, 29 euros and 30. They must have done it in pounds or dollars originally. But I'll tell you more about that, and I'll show you a little video of the house. Uh, bon dia, Portugal! Joao de uh, yesterday uh, had a competitor in this department. Let's play Michael's effort and see if any more will come in on 913-590-303. Here's Michael in Miranda de Corvo yesterday. Bon dia, Portugal! But you have to know it's wherever. Bon dia, Portugal! And there's Bon dia, Portugal! There from Michael Barton. Originally from Chicago, now bellowing across the countryside in Miranda de Corvo. <laughs> any more of those? 913-590-303, if you will. Let's see who's in this morning. Winding right back to 746, still maintaining his position. It's a tough job, but someone's got to do it in the tea duck vacuum. James, thank you so much with your bon dia, Gampus. Feliz terça todos como va at 746 this morning with a mindful moment. Let's begin this morning's proceedings with a mindful moment from Soren Kierkegaard. People demand freedom of speech. Yes, there's a lot of that around at the moment, isn't there? People demand freedom of speech as a compensation for freedom of thought, which they seldom use. Oh, judgmental, Soren, but I think we can see that from time to time, can't we? In the landscape of human beings at the moment, people demand freedom of speech as a compensation for freedom of thought, which they seldom use. And funnily enough, karmically, you might think they do attract to themselves others doing exactly the same thing. Funny old world, isn't it? A mindful dad joke. Remember, when you're dead, you do not know you are dead. We don't know that for sure, do we? But let's go with it for the sake of this mindful dad joke. Remember, when you're dead, you do not know you're dead. It is only painful for others. The same applies when you are stupid. There's a distinctly judgmental tone to uh, those uh, shares this morning. Thank you, James, very much indeed. Joao de Nort off on holiday. Spring holiday today, returning 29th of March. That's a lovely holiday, isn't it? A um, couple of weeks away then. More than. Um, have a great trip, Joao de Nort, and we are hoping for the occasional po postcard, digital postcard here. Bus to Vienna, train to Vigo, Madrid, Barcelona, fly to Nice, very nice in Nice, auto to Como, Lake Como in Italy, and train to Venice, Rome, and flying back to Porto, bolt back to Ponte Lima. Phew, that is a lovely, lovely trip there, and I'm sure uh, Joao de Nort, well, he, he's already shared the details of that itinerary, did that last Tuesday. And uh, we'll make a little video of that, I think, because isn't that a wonderful thing to do? Move to Portugal and then travel Europe in that way in a beautifully planned trip using the train, the plane and automobile um, there. Thank you very much. Well, not have a wonderful time. Uh, you and Pam, lots of love to you both. And thank you very much indeed for sharing what you've shared already about that trip before you've even begun. Bon, bon voyage, bon voyage. Uh, amigos there. And uh, we've got some visual dad jokes I should dwell on for a moment. So I, I don't forget them. A reframe on this one, meditation. Now, I think we, we're going to have it, be having a, a political discussion this morning. Sometimes those things don't go especially well, do they? I'm going to do my best to chair it so that we can be objective and uh, find out more about Shager and their intentions this morning with Miguel Silva. And sometimes two, people do get their panties in a bunch and their knickers in a twist when it comes to the politics, religion and other push button subjects in our world. Um, meditation, perhaps, is the um, answer. Uh, if you have got your panties in a bunch or your knickers in a twist, I'm going to have to get rid of the ticker tape for a moment because meditation is great because we could all use a little sit down and the chance to shut the, and that's been changed very nicely. It's been changed to shut the hick up, uh, shut the up, up on um, any given occasion. If you feel yourself this morning, if you feel your um, bile or temperature rising in the political debate, just take a moment, okay? Because uh, as I said before, um, I think it's important that we have discussion where there's division and conversation where there's conflict. That's how we roll here on the Good Morning Portugal show. And look, um, this, this is table football, the Premier League version. I think this would apply to quite a lot of uh, football leagues. <laughs> the, um, the fellas there, all of them injured on that table there. Thank you very much uh, for that, James. Oh, staying in the cafe environment, which is where you would tend to see that game. Guess where this is from Coach Turner, who we'll move on to in just a moment. A pastel donata, although in silver foil, alum, aluminum, in an aluminum uh, cake dish there. I don't often see that here in Portugal. 
Um, so that's a little giveaway to the fact that it might not be in Portugal, but a very good looking Galal there. Uh, that is Hertfordshire in the UK. And they also sell Portuguese beer in there. Please send any pictures you have of your favorite Portuguese cafe or bar around the world that gives you that little bit of Portugal. That one in Hertfordshire. I don't know the name. If I knew the name of the cafe, I would give it to you. And I think the coach will be sending a picture to us of the uh, exterior. Uh, good morning to you if you've just joined us. I think a few people are joining us uh, so that they can ask questions of uh, Miguel Silva from Shega this morning. Let's see, who he, let's see who else is in this morning. We've got uh, the coach, of course, who is wishing Joao de Nord a great trip. Enjoy. Sounds like a great trip, says the coach to you, John. Bon dia, Gumpers. E feliz terça, como estás? Noah weather here today. So peeing down, not just cats and dogs, but two by two of every animal by the sound of it in Hertfordshire. Again, he says, I might be taking a car to coffee this morning, but training and coaching later. Great. What a, what a, uh, what an asset. <laughs> I could have stretched out a bit. What an asset you are, uh, Coach Turner. But isn't that amazing? Uh, serving us and, and uh, the youth uh, in and around London there in the UK, helping out with athletics, uh, training, mentoring and coaching. Uh, Diamond Giza, Coach Turner, and looking forward to seeing you here in Portugal soon. If walking is good for you, is the God's God tip of the day. Walking in nature is even better. Just being somewhere beautiful improves your well-being. So even if you have to drive, even if you have to drive there, it should be worth it. Walking on uneven surfaces like beaches will work your feet and ankles, though, of course, you will need to take some care. If there are hills as well, that will add some more effort too. Always good for the heart. Excellent. Thank you very much for that this morning, Coach Turner. And on that note of beaches, walking on sand, I think, is, is thought to be universally useful. Adds a little bit more drama and uh, effort into the mix. Europe's best beach destination, Algarve, dethroned for the first time since 2018. However, even though that is the case, uh, the Algarve has lost uh, its uh, Europe's leading beach destination title to Madeira. So it's still within uh, Portugal. Everybody, no need to worry there. Algarve and Madeira just throwing that uh, accolade back and forth between them. Questions already coming in for our Shaker guests. Thank you, Erica. Thank you for being here this morning. And Anna, a Swede in Portugal, off to Carteira this morning. Anyone in that area up for a coffee or a drink today or tomorrow? Excellent. Gumpers meeting Gumpers. Love to see that. So if you're off to Cartera and you'd like to meet Anna, I've met Anna once uh, down there in the Algarve. Um, yes, please do. Uh, please uh, make contact with Anna. What's the best way to do that? Um, I wonder. Maybe in the Portugal club. Yeah. Um, hola, bon dia from Sunny Saya from Baddy. Morning, Baddy, where I get to toil. Oh, and thank you, Gary, for joining the Portugal club this morning as well. Um, where I get to toil on my website in Saya while I listen in today. Let us know how we can help with that, Baddy. Looking forward to finding out what the crack is after the elections. Thank you very much for being here. And great to have you back in the country. Bon dia, everyone. We've already heard from you, Michael, uh, from your rooftop Bon dia from Pinky as well. I was here an hour ago. Forgot about DST. Yes, the first DST casualty. Um, certainly the first one to um, out themselves as such. Good morning to you, Pinky. Wow, that extra hour probably does make a big difference, right? Bon dia, Ashtorosh. Uh, let's see what happens in the near and far future. Who is that? And uh, bon dia from Antonio Barbosa, Feliz Terza Feira, who had some interesting uh, things to say in his post-election roundup over the Portugal club as well. Thanks for all you do, Antonio Barbosa. Tony time, man in the Mino. And uh, Jim White's here as well. Good morning, Jim. Bon dia, Toros. And Owen, bon dia, all safe and happy travels. Joao de Nort and Pam and Paul Richards with a greetings from the Algarve as well. Look out, Frank, coming to Tavira today and tomorrow. Look, more Gumpers meeting Gumpers. Fantastic. Bon dia from Pam as well. And Matty, thank you for your message yesterday, Matty. The police were in San Martino de Porto. I think somebody who was uh, paragliding um, had a little bit, got into a bit of difficulty yesterday. Uh, so San Martino in the news and Matty sending me a screenshot yesterday. I've still not been able to find out if everyone is safe and well. I'll do more on that today. Thank you, Matty. Bon dia, alegria todos. De quinta entre aguas con sol. So a sunny day in central Portugal. And as I said, we might get to go to central Portugal with Mama Bear later on in the show. who has been traveling and arrived late back last night to her country pad. Housing problems. So, okay, I've starred that up as well to go to our Shager guest later on. And, and of course, if there are spokespeople from PS and AD who would like to come and uh, talk to us and let us know um, how, um, well, what the relationship for foreigners, immigrants, expats uh, might be in this new um, post-election regime, 
Um, it'd be good to have a conversation with any of the political parties and not just the big ones. If we have a look at one of the um, voting cards, and I saw this um, on the web um, or social media, I think, over the weekend as somebody stepped into the booth. That does look like a polling booth. That looks like a pen cap right there, doesn't it? And they're getting ready to make their vote. Bon dia to you as well, Sarah. Look at all the people you could have voted for. We're happy to have them all uh, on the show. Not all at once, because that would be quite the mess, wouldn't it? But there are a lot of parties here, and it'll be interesting to hear what they've got to say, what they can tell us about Portugal, and what they think about uh, the uh, immigrant situation and how they intend to um, deal with it and treat us uh, immigrants here in Portugal as a, as a contribution to the society and economy here. So if you know anyone who's a member of those parties, um, get in touch with them and tell them they're very welcome to come and talk about uh, their their particular position, political position here on the Good Morning Portugal show. Um, Pam's just calling in for a few minutes before heading off to work then on to Caldash. Busy day. Oh, you're trying to do two things by the sound of it here in Portugal. Good luck. We'll start uh, with that uh, this morning. Uh, safe travels. Joel Denort from Jim. And my best mate says, Jackie, good morning to you, Jackie. Um, my best mate is working in a Portuguese bakery in London. He's getting what he says is a Portuguese attitude. So he can join me next year in lush Coimbra. Wow. How's it going, Jackie? How can we help uh, you with your move? I, and, and yes, I've uh, already responded to that comment. I don't know the answer to that yet, Matty, but I'll find out. Um, James, very pleased to see you. Matthias there in capital letters. Oh, look at you two greeting each other in that man cavey kind of way. And Larry here as well. Bon dia. Chocolate in Obidosh or surfing in Panish. The choices are endless here on the Silver Coast. Great to have you here on this side of the water. Larry, see you at the Storyteller soon, I suspect. Bon dia all from Frank and Sarah Taylor. Good morning to you. And excellent guest this morning, Carlos. Thank you very much, Douglas. And as I said, yes, not party political or partisan we're open to to guests from all political parties. But I think it's right that we start with the Shega or that they be early in our um, scheme of things uh, so that they can uh, tell us or so that Miguel is their representative this morning. Oh, I should tell you, um, just so you know, our guest is uh, Miguel Silva. He is the director of the Tezeno Institute, a leading conservative think tank in Portugal and a local councilman affiliated with Portugal's third largest political party. That would be Chega. He's a, a councillor then for Chega or coming from that political angle. He has previously worked as an analyst for Wikistrat. I'm not sure what that is, but he can tell us about it. And his career includes postings about the EU's External Action Service, the Organisation for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, the OPCW, and the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO. He's written for outlets such as Revolve magazine, which focuses on sustainability, the national interest, the American conservative, the European conservative, or the Small Wars Journal, which sounds like a chilling publication. More from him later on at around nine. We've got to show you that house. Uh, Rehousing issues. Uh, would reviewing the Napoleonic inheritance rules be a useful thing? for the politicians to do. And Sarah, I'd be interested to hear your guest views of the dynamic of the Algarve region and why the votes turned out like they did. And in case you didn't know, this is how they turned out. Um, oh, Faro being covered up there. But that you'll see that the winning, and only by a whisker, the AD, who are see, thought to be triumphant. And I think there's a couple of seats still to count because there's only two seats difference between AD and PS. But anyway, let me just move your question there. Shager uh, took furrow, so to speak. Uh, pink is PS and orange is uh, the uh, Democratic Alliance there. Also, um, the AD taking uh, Madeira and the Azores. So that's how it looks. And you, it's interesting to see the picture there that where there are the most immigrants and the largest amount of tourism, uh, that's where Shager have uh, made their mark down there in the south, uh, which, to which... Um, uh, Sarah, I think her question is connected. So I will put that to my guest a little bit later on. For the time being, I'm going to show you, I'm going to take you to the countryside now, to the Portuguese countryside. And you can win this. Watch this because you can win this home, this off grid home, if you take part in the raffle I'm about to tell you.
I, I feel relaxed just watching that. Isn't that amazing? Uh, let me tell you more about it and how you could win it. Enter Raffle to win a unique off-grid property. And those of you who are fans of off-grid properties and um, will see the straw bale construction and the wattling, wattling door. But if that's the right, uh, I think it's got um, cob. It's a cob house, isn't it? Great opportunity, it says here, at raffle.com um, to win this particular property. property. And it was it's just so relaxing to be there for a moment um, in central Portugal. I will put the link so you can have a look for yourself. Uh, into the chat as well there you go this is a new thing to me raffle which i don't think think sounds like the best name i mean i guess it does what it, it says on the tin in a way raffle or raffle in which you can raffle all sorts of things but it does sound a bit like naffle or effle doesn't it um and it's uh 86 days to go um, and the ticket price is approximately 29 euros and 30 cents. This is not in any way a validation or endorsement. I don't do your own due diligence as to whether this works. Um, but it says here, great opportunity. We are re relocating and starting our new mission. So while the world is in a Mad Max state, that's what I was talking about earlier on. We are searching for the new guardians of this beautiful Quinta the Garden of Mother Tree in an exciting fun, F-U-N, capital letters, fundraising and outside the box unusual way. We love to create magic moments and this place offers great, great powers. It's just like it's been written like it's a spell. Um, it cannot be sold in an ordinary way. We also wish to raise funding for our next project, which is to create a small private donation based but most beautiful holistic and sacred birth, birds and butterfly sanctuary in Europe. Birth needs to move out of hospital frequency areas into beautiful, peaceful and honoring sacred nesting places, which are empowering and safe for mamas to embody the magic of birth and its transformation. So here's what you could win um, if you take part in this raffle. This rural property has an idyllic location at the foot of the mountain range. Ah, the Gordunha Mountain, Serra da Gordunha, situated in central Portugal near Fundao by the charming village of Val de Prazeres which means Valley of Joy, Valley of Pleasures. The uh, area is extremely fertile and of great natural beauty. It is known throughout Portugal as the region that produces the best fruits. That's where the Fundal cherries come from, of course, due to its special climate. Yes, there you go, especially the famous Fundal cherries. The Serra da Gordunha mountain itself has a fantastic hiking trails and offers fantastic views of the Serra da Estrela, the highest mountain range in Portugal, as well as beautiful river beaches where you can enjoy crystal clear water and hot days with your family and friends. The neighborhood and natural surrounding is blessed with unlimited amounts of water directly from the mountain, which is why many settle here. The whole valley is enriched with minerals and crystals such as rock and rose quartz and is the reason for the wonderful good energy you feel here. The property is completely off grid made with adobe earth bags of 80 square meters there you go and land of over one hectare approximately two and a half acres isn't that amazing the land has several large old cork oaks which are the land's ornament and gift in particular there is a over 150 year old mother tree which protects the site guides her gardeners and gives the garden natural summer shade this place is her garden and maybe you are her next guardians. There you go. I've put the link uh, to that raffle um, in the um, chat this morning. What a beautiful place uh, and your chance to win it there. Uh, morning, everyone. Great question, Sarah, from Mrs. M. Uh, thank you very much for being here this morning, Mrs. M, as well. Lots of questions coming in for Miguel. Looking forward to talking him to him in just a few minutes. Before we go there, I forgot to say thank you yesterday. The opening meme this morning was this one. The Englishman and the Irishman walk into a bar and meet a Portuguese man at the Storytellers Palace. You might recognize uh, Marco there, chef, host, and uh, he, he who will give you a warm welcome and some amazing food at the Storytellers Palace, which Bobby and I were able to enjoy. And we were filmed doing so in episode one of An Englishman and an Irishman Walk Into a Bar. Episode one, A Tender Octopus and a Dark Secret About Cod, which many of you have watched and given me some lovely feedback. So thank you very much. Our debut episode, our debut full-length episode um, is up there on our YouTube channel. And we have further programs to come from Tamar and uh, Coimbra as well. So looking forward to uh, sharing those with you as well. I think I forgot this uh, earlier on as well. Um, this is a, a visual dad joke warning being issued to you now. I'm sorry and I apologize mean the same thing. This is a classic this morning. Thank you very much 
indeed for this. I'm sorry I apologize. I mean the same thing, uh, unless, of course, you're at a funeral. Thank you very much for that, James. Keep them coming and any others of this kind. 913-590-303. Let's get that ticker tape back onto the screen as we anticipate the arrival of Miguel Silva. He's, joined, he's uh, in the green room and getting ready to join us on the screen. A couple more things uh, I wanted to tell you about, just so you know. Um, across Portugal at the moment, um, we've got the uh, GNR clamping down on... Let's have a look. Where did that go? Oh, yes, a Portugal news uh, article. Uh, police clamping down on car safety. Just so you know, where you're out and about, the Republican National Guard, the GNR, is carrying out an inspection operation aimed at the use of seatbelts, helmets, and child restraint systems. That sounds rather severe, doesn't it? A child restraint system in your car. <laughs> I think just basically means a car seat. Uh, between today, that uh, went out um, early this morning, I believe, or late last night, and March the 17th. So the GNR will be out and about doing uh, on the street checks on the highways. The road pole safety devices operation is already a regular annual practice of the GNR and takes place within the scope of the European Traffic Police Network road pole and organization created by the police of traffic, the police of traffic in Europe to improve, improve road safety and compliance with traffic regulations. So there's a specific initiative going on in the next few days that will be checking on seatbelts and to make sure kids are properly secured in the back of the car unless they're over a certain height then they can be a front seat passenger i think that's 150 uh, centimeters and motorcyclists making sure they are properly helmeted must be the blessing of the helmets uh, coming up soon right um and um just to give you a little bit of um of a backstory then as we welcome as we begin to um as we look forward to bringing uh, Miguel onto the screen, this is this is the backstory uh, or the context uh, for our conversation. Portugal suffers hung parliament in elections that see a surge in, and they're using the phrase here. We will ask Miguel about this far right. They're being called. Um, I'm going to bring this uh, article onto the screen now um, about the hung parliament because this this is a possibility. There might be another election, and not too far away. What a mess, you might say. Um, how can anything get done in the country if uh, we're not constantly in the election booth or the uh, Portuguese citizens who are able to vote uh, are just voting all the time rather than letting a government get on with it? A political commentator then, Luis Marques Mendes, uh, predicted fresh elections early next year. In fact, a 40 year political system in Portugal dominated by two parties, the centre right PSD and the socialist PS, may be over after elections in Sunday produced a hung parliament with a far-right protest party picking up over 18% of the votes and an anti-corruption and immigration ticket. Although technically the Democratic Alliance, the Alianza Democratica, or AD, a centre-right coalition comprising the PSD, CDS, PP, and Partido Popular Monarquico, Monarquiso, Monarquiso, the monarchists, won the elections, the margin was only by just over 1%. It means that the coalition stands no chance of forming a majority government led by the leader of the centre-right PSD, Luis Montenegro. AD picked up 29.49% of the votes, including Madeira, corresponding to 79 seats in parliament. And uh, the closest competitors, I believe, have 77. It is unlikely, highly unlikely, that the two main parties will cut a deal to form a government leaving the centre-right facing a minority government that will have a hard time achieving any kind of consensus for next year's state budget 2025, which has to be agreed in October. That's the political situation then. Let's bring him onto the screen. Nice big round of applause for Miguel Silva. Good morning to you, Miguel. Well, good morning, Carl. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Good to have you here. Um, we, we spoke, I think, a couple of years ago, just, just so yes. everybody knows. Um, and you very kindly talked to us about the uh, Portuguese political system towards the end of the interview. Um, I said, oh, and Miguel, which party do you support? Do you mind telling us? In in the UK where I'm from, people are very guarded about that. So I, I couched the question in quite a, in, in a way that, you know, you didn't have to answer the question if you didn't want to. But very proudly, you told me uh, you were a Shaker supporter. And I think my jaw dropped because um, I had been conditioned to believe um, that uh, Shaker meant certain things. And I was quite surprised. I think you were you were aware of that at the time. Uh, fast forwarding a couple of years, uh, congratulations to to you and your party. You've quadrupled uh, your seats in the Portuguese parliament. 
How is that for you and your colleagues? Uh, how's that been in over the last couple of days? Um, well, thank you for the opportunity again, Carl, and uh, thank you for your interest. Just going back to the uh, to the previous conversation. Listen, I was I'm an elected uh, uh, politician. There'd be no point in in trying to hide anything. Uh, at this <laughs> in my case. <laughs> yeah, not yeah, right. Yeah, no, not my bad, not yours. Of course, you are a councillor, aren't you? You're a shaker councillor, and you were. I'm, I'm a very, very small local councilman in the periphery of Lisbon, um, uh, in what we call a junta de freguesia, uh, uh, um, or assembly de freguesia. Okay, all right. And and how's it been then? I mean, obviously, it must have been a very exciting election process for you, and quite the victory for Shaker. To, to be, I think you're already the third uh, party, but you've you've really increased that uh, or your influence. And I think you know this is what I want to talk to you about. What's said about you, and here you are to say it for yourself this morning and explain to us. I mean, largely here, immigrants, foreigners, expats, to really understand what's going on with Shager. Um, I, I, this is something I've learned from the Portuguese people, I think. Where there is conflict, let's have a conversation. Where there's division, let's have a discussion. Let's not just go with all the superficial name-calling that the media tends to do. Let's find out from you um, what's really going on. So let's start with that. Far-right, extreme, how, how, how do you address that? That must be a constant bugbear for you to live in that perception or that conversation that people have. <clears throat> yes, well, it, it was rather more uncomfortable in the beginning of the party when, when people uh, still believed the media. Uh, I think it's less so now. I don't think people take it as, as, as seriously. Um, listen, the, the founders of the party came from PSD and CDS. Right. So you know, if it is a party of fascists, they would, they, they would have to be very uh, well camouflaged fascists for, for decades, um, all I can say. Um, and in fact, there is no tradition of extremism in, in, in Portugal. And when, whenever you have had uh, extremism, it has come from the left, not, not the right. I'm sure you know that the only terrorist uh, group that we had in Portugal was a left-wing one, a far-left one, after the revolution. Um, so, you know, what can we, what, can, what should be said about Shaker? It, it is a conservative party, and and. Portugal has not had a conservative party since the revolution. Let's, mm. let's be honest. Um, CDS was the one that came closest, but they were Christian Democrats, so quite close to the center. Um, and, and now we do have a conservative party, but that's what it is. In my humble opinion, in my definition, a, a conservatives are as close to moderation as, as you can possibly get. Um, that's so interesting. Of violence, of revolutions, that's on the other side. Something has happened in the narrative then to cause all of this talk of far right and extremism. And it occurred to me, actually, and I don't want to hog the questions here because I know there are many that are coming in. But I did, I did, I did want to catch up with you a bit with this and to kind of decode the narrative a little bit. The very classifications politically come from the left, don't they? Uh, it would appear the, you know, the academic uh, approach to politics often is a very sort of left wing matter. And it seems that the narrative, the context for the conversation about politics is dominated by a left perspective. And that's how you get this phenomenon of, you know, these words that are slipped into the conversation to undermine what I think you've talked about there as moderation, really. But uh, uh, the, this moderation is express, expressed as extremism because the people telling the stories tend to come from that perspective um, and, and, you know, the, the, um, the, the intellectual um, matter of politics tends to be a left-leaning thing. W would you say that's true? I would say that's especially true of Portugal. Um, <laughs> I would say in general, in, in every country, the academia tends to be uh, uh, more to the left, more more yeah. liberal in, yeah. in more conservative countries, and in more liberal countries tends to be more progressive. Um, yes. It, it's always, always um, um, skews to the left. Um, but it's more so in Portugal because we had a, 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 um, an almost para-Marxist revolution. And as a consequence, the entire narrative was built on left-wing values, on progressive and even Marxist values. I mean, you remember the last time we, we talked about the Portuguese political system, how someone was mentioning that the word socialist is in the constitution. So it, it was a very heavily uh, left-wing, uh, uh, um, biased uh, uh, narrative. And so it was, I explained at the time, 
in order for a right-wing party to exist in that ecosystem, they had to have the word socialist in their name. That's why that's how you 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 end up with PSD and CDS. Uh-huh. Um, they were not socialist parties, but they had to have social in the name, otherwise they'd be called fascist. Um, and this is also why there were no, I would say, serious attempts at creating a conservative party until now, because everyone would always be uh, afraid of what the the regime would would do and say and categorize and label. And and now, you know, it's it's been fifty years since since the revolution. So I think. Uh, two generations since, we are now capable of being more objective about uh, the revolution, about the regime, and especially at a time when I think everyone senses that the regime is worn out, that the regime is 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 has uh, become a, a burden, and and that people pay more attention to the labels of the regime than to the substance of the policies. Wow. Uh, very interesting, and of course, not only happening here in Portugal. What, what one of my um, one of the thoughts that occurred to me, because in my in my native UK uh, we have had a somebody elected to the parliament, George Galloway. I suspect you're you're aware of uh, oh, the yes. situation with George Galloway, and um, there there are echoes because the establishment has reacted reacted very badly um, to this situation. And whilst claiming to be interested in democracy and democratic, the extremism seems to be an extreme of democracy. You know, people people from outside the the political establishment have been voted for. That seems to be what's going on with Chega here in Portugal. That seems to be what happened with George Galloway. And the political establishment doesn't like it. And that's perhaps why you are constantly referred to uh, within the sort of narratives of populism, extremism, and being this far-right um, situation. Uh, would you agree with that analysis as well? That, you know, this is like extreme democracy, and 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 the incumbents don't like it up them, as it were. Mm, yes, uh, in, in the in, in journalism especially, um, the name calling and and the bias is is especially bad because I I, I remember I was having this conversation uh, the other day. I remember that at the time of the Iraq War, uh, you will remember that there would be people arguing in favor and against, and the media would give a fair voice to both sides. And nowadays, you might notice that whenever we discuss conflicts, be it Libya or Syria or Ukraine, there is only one narrative. There's, there are very, very few people giving, giving an opinion to, in favor of the other side. You don't get a fair, a fair uh, I would say, a fair system, a fair hearing to, to the other side. And it's the same thing in politics. Um, I think that journalists, they don't really have much in the way of freedom to, to research and to investigate uh, as they used to. They, um, the, the profession has become far more precarious because anyone can report news nowadays on social media, often enough faster than they can convey the news on, on traditional mainstream media. Um, and on, on top of that, the world has become more complex. Now a journalist needs to know about economics and about history. And of course, they have too little time and they are underpaid. And so the quality of the journalists today is very low. You have minions working in, in, in newspapers and TVs. You don't really have um, you know, top-notch investigative journalists like, like right. you used to. And, yeah. and I'm afraid I have to say that most media have become propaganda outlets. Yeah. And what is truly sad, and I, I see this not just in the people who are against Shega, but even in, in Shega's own um, supporter base, I can see this, yeah. that people still watch TV, but that's not the problem. The problem is that they take TV seriously. Um, yes. And no, no matter how many times TV gets it wrong, and, and the, pan, the pandemic, I would say, was an excellent example of this, they said everything in its opposite, and people will still believe it. And and I have examples in my family and within the party. People watch the news and they buy everything that they're given. Mm. Um, so what can be said about this? I mean, the, you have to look for independent um, sources, and the place to start is not with mainstream media. Yep. 
Well, we, hopefully we're doing a little bit to, 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 to have a more serious uh, and nuanced conversation. And I think the phenomenon you described is getting worse, not better. So I think it's very important. It's probably going to be smaller audiences having longer conversations rather than the uh, legacy media, as I think they're called. Uh, interestingly, um, with the conversation we're having, we've been watching Australia, Miguel here. I'm glad to have come across this channel. Rosa, good morning to you. And we have people watching all over the country here. And I think the big question, and where I'd like to start with you in this um, understanding, Shega, better what your intentions are as a party. And I know you're, you're speaking with your particular view of your party's policies. And, and of course, we have to see it through that lens. How else could we do it? The, the big worry for us foreigners, Miguel, obviously, us expats, um, is... Is, is what we've heard from the mainstream media, that this is an anti-immigration party. Uh, Joao Denor is asking, please clarify for the record, what is Shager's actual view on immigration and how does that differ from what the opposition or what the media, for that matter, is saying? Uh, well, <laughs> when, we, when, when we in Portugal discuss the problem of immigration, um, obviously no one is referring to the expat communities that come from Europe and, and the US and they work and they bring capital and they bring investment, that, that would be silly. Um, we're discussing mostly um, the, the, the immigrant communities from third world countries that come without qualifications and that bring problems. So, for example, I am a councilman in the municipality of Oedes, which is uh, in the outskirts of Lisbon. And I think it was a month or two ago, we had a member of an Angolan mafia gang assassinate a person with an AK-47. Now, as you might imagine, that is not a common occurrence uh, in, 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 in Oedish or, or in Portugal. And, and this sort of thing, you know, it's not quite as bad as it is in, say, Sweden or France or even in the UK. We don't have acid attacks or terrorism yet. But it, certainly things are not improving. They're, they're, they're worsening. And the problem is not even that the problems exist. I would say the problem is more acute. It's that the mainstream parties and the mainstream media will not even acknowledge that immigration and, and mass immigration, and mass immigration from the third world is a problem. Now, if you look at Shega's program, I think it's perfectly uh, uh, common sense, pragmatic program. What, what we're referring to when we say controlling immigration is mostly controlling illegal immigration, uh, um, having some quotas and not having mass immigration, and, you know, some common sense uh, policies. So uh, you might know that the uh, current government, the current socialist government, uh, abolished uh, border control. They they um, they abolished the agency that took care of it. They they took its uh, competences and they they gave them to um, the police. I, I don't know if PSP or GNR, um, but they ab they abolished border controls. So uh, that to us, of course, it's adding fuel to the fire is certainly not going to help. Um, and. I, I can go through the measures that we that we present one by one, but I mean, n none of this uh, that I can see would impact um, expats or, or or immigrants like you to to the country. Uh, I mean, we do have some pr proposals that that would stress that um, you know learning Portuguese and, and Portuguese culture and history would become mandatory. Mm -hmm. um, what else uh, in order if you have double citizenship and you commit a violent crime then you would be subject to to deportation um i mean none of this seems to me to be particularly controversial but it is a, 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 let's say a, a, an electoral platform that shega is very adamant on and that other parties will will pay very little attention to Yes, and would account for your popularity as well, I suspect, because this, this is part of the political problem, isn't it, is that those difficult issues tend to get um, either co-opted, actually. I, I, I think the bigger parties have been happy to have uh, immigrants as a scapegoat. It's, a, it's an old-fashioned, it's, it's as old as time, it's as old as politics, isn't it, to blame foreigners um, for problems. Um, and it seems you, you, you at least have some um, courage to name those problems and have uh, proposals for dealing with them rather than avoiding it. And it would appear people, um, you know, everyday people seem to like that. 
and have given you support for it, um, perhaps to the embarrassment and shame of the mainstream parties who won't touch it with a barge pole, as it were. So thank you for addressing that, uh, your actual view on immigration. Um, and another question from Joao, what are the top misconceptions people have of Shago? We've talked to, to some extent about this, um, but what, how, how would you answer that? Well, I think that, you know, the the most concerning one is that we're a, an extremist radical party when, when in fact, as conservatives, I would argue we're, we're the most moderate one. Um, the Again, <laughs> the system that we live in, you know, we live in a bankrupt country um, and and we're, 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 we're sexualizing children in schools. I'm, I'm sure that we're not the, the extremist ones in, in, in that equation. Um, right. Now... Just, just you know, if if one message could could be um, passed on is that we're not a radical party. We may have you know, different views ideologically, but we're certainly not extremists. Um, what else? That we're anti-immigration. You know, the whole immigration story is actually quite interesting because if you look at Europe and and the new right wing uh, populism, if you will, phenomenon of the of the past decade, I don't actually know a single right-wing party in the whole of Europe that is against immigration because that's always the label that that is that is that's how the the narrative is constructed is that we're an anti-immigration party I don't know any yeah. party that is against immigration I don't know any party who says that we're going to close the borders we're going to be North Korea and no one will come in I, yes I, I've never heard of that I mean even if you think of the most extreme examples I'm thinking golden dawn in Greece would that to me is very semi-fascist um, I don't know that their program says that they wouldn't accept anyone to come into Greece. There's there's a significant difference between not wanting mass immigration from third world countries whose cultures are extremely different from ours and being against immigration. That, that, it's nonsense, completely They nonsense. do tend to get collapsed into each other, don't they? Very interesting. So that is perhaps the top misconception people have um, of Shega there. I suppose what where people might have a, an understandable concern is that whilst you say that as a at a party political level, you attract people into your um, membership or certainly who might vote for you, if not sort of direct party uh, card carrying members, but are attracted to what they think they know about the party, who could be described as extremists. Would you accept that that you do you could whilst not being an extreme party with extreme policies, you do attract people um, who are angry about these issues and could be quite extreme. If we do, we would be happy to moderate them. Okay. <laughs> now, listen, um, I think prior, prior to the existence of Shega, the only party that was, the one party that you could say was considered to be the, um, the, ugly, the ugly duckling of the Portuguese political system was PNR, the, the, the National Renovation Party. They, they were an anti-immigration party. They never got even 1% of the vote. And the only reason why that party became, let's say, toxic or infamous was because a neo-Nazi biker gang decided to join that party. Mm -hmm. And that gang was associated with criminal activity and with murder, and they gave a bad reputation to the party. But the party itself was made up of perfectly regular people. They, they, they yeah. didn't have, I wouldn't say that they have a particularly extremist platform, but they were an anti-immigration, you might say almost xenophobic uh, party. But again, that party, I, I'm giving it as an example because even in, in the heyday of its infamy, they had 0.2%, 0.3% of the vote. Mm -hmm. So you say, well, we might attract some undesirables, um, some deplorables. <laughs> Fine. Let's say that we do attract some deplorables. Yes. If we, if if part of our vote that is deplorable is 0.3%, I, I I don't think that's great cause for concern. No, and I'm and I'm reassured that you would you would moderate them as you put it. And and of course the problem you have with, with with the perception issue and and the mainstream media is that they will seize upon those opportunities to smear you in that way if you attract those sorts of people. I understand how that works. Um, we've got lots of comments and questions coming in. Shaker has definitely been more moderate since its birth. The party was born as a cry of revolt, as they said what people felt. You need them as an opposing voice in parliament. Uh, now a country. And now to run a country, I have my doubts. Now, this is the big problem for any new party, isn't it? Who um, I think uh, another criticism of the party, um, not of its policies necessarily, but of its makeup, 
And you you can't help being new. That's one thing, isn't it? I think you have a, a, a approximately a five year history, and you have a charismatic, uh, enigmatic leader. And that is a criticism, isn't it? Is that you know he is um, he is a what could be described as a, as a great leader and a man who speaks his mind. And, and let's let's hope we see more of that in politics, not just people who would appear to be saying what their paymasters say, but someone who is genuine, genuinely moved and passionate about what they believe in, like it or, or loathe it, they are saying what they believe in. And that would appear to be um, how uh, Andre Ventura comes across. How does that scale from having um, an influential leader into what Antonio's talking about here of running a country? Um, like I said, you can't help being new, but how do you plan to go from attracting uh, people with uh, you know, who have, have passion and heartfelt connection, patriotic values, and see uh, something rotten and, and and not working in in the establishment to wanting something new. How do you go from meeting that need and the excitement created by that into running a country? Well, you you as I told you before, many of the founders of the party came from other parties already. Uh, we have a number of MPs and local councilmen. Um, like me, who came from PSD, who came from CDS, and many of us already have either political experience or professional experience that we could put into uh, um, forming a government. Um, the the notion that the party uh, is based solely around its leader, obviously the leader is uh, uh, very important, but we do have professionals within the party. Now, you wouldn't know that, because the media wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't let you know. So, uh, if you turn on the TV or if you read newspapers, I would I would dare you to find any voices that speak for Shaga. The only people that they interview at times are MPs, and 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 that's about it. It, it, it. One of the most ridiculous things, and this is how you can see the media are completely biased. You have these political commentary uh, TV shows. And they usually had four pundits. Uh, they they were supposed to represent four parties, but nowadays you still have four pundits, and one of them still represents CDS, even though CDS was is an extinct party. They have no MPs, or they had until they didn't have until this election. Um, but they have no one from Shagan, even though we were the third largest party. So the whole system is rotten. They, they, there are no voices for Shega. There are no columnists from Shega. There are no pundits from Shega. So obviously, you wouldn't know uh, the people that that are within the party unless you take, you know, if you have a, a, a specific interest, you might dig a little deeper. You go into social media and you find out. But but if you don't bother, you don't know. I, I get the sense that even the the members of the party don't don't fully know, um, you know, the 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 professionals that we have uh, within the party and, and from different areas of um, of um, uh, of the private sector and the public sector. Yeah, interesting, interesting. And um, so which brings us to um, another one of these words that you get called, uh, or certainly the leader gets called a populist, uh, which has brought up the uh, response from someone else. What is wrong with populism, um, of course? Now, this, again, I think, goes to back to the establishment, doesn't it? And the kind of sneering view of some within politics that, you know, most people aren't capable of um, being voters in a way. You know, if, if you if you have a, a popular or populist view, um, this is something that happened, um, you know, certainly in the UK. I've seen I've seen people who have a, a view that is disagreed with to be put down sort of intellectually. And, and that's where I think this whole populism thing is is, is coming from. How, how can you manage that? How can you get through that constant criticism of just being put down as a populist party with a populist leader and get things done? And furthermore, I mean, we're seeing here in the questions that are coming in, uh, in like this. Did Trump invite uh, them to Mar-a-Lago yet? You are, the, Ventura is being rolled in with Bolsonaro and Trump um, and these, these people who are called populists and charismatic and just giving the people what they want. What's actually wrong with giving people what they want? Is, is, is this, uh, again, part of the establishment problem is, that in, in a way, we like democracy, but we don't like it when it goes against our interests and everyday people get a chance to say what they would like? 
Well, like you said at the beginning, uh, you're interviewing me. I, I'm not speaking for the party. I'm giving you my, right. my personal opinion. Yeah. I think the, the label of populism is pure nonsense. Right. Pure nonsense. Because a populist is not someone who is seeking to be controversial. Now, if the label was sensationalist, I might understand. Yeah. The populist, I, I don't think that Shega or, or the new right-wing parties are populist at all, because we're all will, willing to be controversial and we're all willing to be hated. I would say, I would argue that the true populists are the people who really do run the, 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 their political conduct according to the polls. And to me, the chief populist in Portugal is actually the president. Now, he is one of the most demagogic, populistic presidents we've ever had. He's, he's not seen as a serious person. I mean, when you have someone who has the, the, the sobriquet of the president of the affections, this okay. is not populism? <laughs> it's, well, it looks like it, it to it, me. I, I'm sorry. I like it, what you mean, yes. Yeah. So um, th w there is a, a particular point of view, a particular perspective that we're putting forth that we know is going to be uh, controversial. Um, and I would, I, would, I would give them this. I would give the, the media and, and the political establishment this. Because mainstream media is barred uh, from, from us, the new parties, because we don't get access to it. We're, we're, usually there are quarantines and red lines drawn around us so that we cannot access it. We have to go into social media. Or if we show up on TV, we do we do so through controversy. So I think that Trump was very good at that at that tactic. That in order to um, to to stand out in the in the daily agenda, you have to be a sensationalist. And he sometimes was intentionally tactically, um, but. Populist I, I, is just a label that makes absolutely no sense. The populists are the ones who will tell people what they want to hear, not what they need to hear. And, and the populists are the ones who tell people that everything is okay. Because mm -hmm. that's popular. No one wants to hear that everything is bad. They want to hear that everything is okay. Very interesting. Thank you. So then how would you compare yourself to reform in the UK, Margaret in the USA, or do you see Portugal have having its own special set of issues or is that just a cross you have to bear the populism and the comparison uh, with these other figures around the world is that just part and parcel of how Shager will have to make its process into parliament and have an effect i think it's a fair it's a fair uh, um, comparison you know portugal is its own country with its own culture and its own issues which are different from america from the uk from the netherlands um but it is a, a fair comparison because we do appreciate, we, we do share a, a number of, uh, of causes and of, um, of posturing with those leaders and with those parties. And in the case of the EU, uh, not so much in the UK anymore, but in the case of the EU, we're in the same political family as people like Salvini and Marine Le Pen. So, you know, those comparisons are not unfair. It's just that there are different issues. Uh, when, when we talk about immigration, the problems of, of immigration in Portugal, they're very different from the immigration problems, let's say, in Sweden. Um, so um, I, would, I would argue that the, the ideological, the philosophical matrix might, it might be the same, but then each country has its own different adaptation. So uh, you might know that Chege is a member of ID, that's uh, Identity and Democracy, it's the, the European family in the European Parliament. Uh -huh. um, and... I would argue that in that family, Shege is to the far left uh, of, of ID because you know, to be to be a right wing in Portugal is is not at all to be radical or, or, or extremist in any way. It's mm -hmm. just, it's just yep. uh, close to the century as it could be. Very interesting. Okay. Uh, bon dia. Good morning, Portugal from USA. Returning in a few days. Been wanting this kind of info. Keep up the, with the great work. Good morning, Portugal. Um, and well, we'll do our best. You know that for me, I, you know, I'm not. I don't see myself as a as a political commentator in any way. But I do get a sense that um, all is not what it seems. And we, I, I, we have a guest, uh, Stephen White, who, who's who's uh, tactics when it comes to property investment. He calls it running towards the fire. And that's how, what I am with this issue. I'm seeing that there is uh, there is a fire. There's a political fire for sure, in all sorts of ways. And I think the best way to deal with this conversation is to have it um, rather than let those let the name calling set the agenda and for fear to be 
um, promoted and used as a, as a political tool, which inevitably is against people. So I thank you for being here uh, and answering the questions this morning. Uh, Doug agrees with my analysis that populist views are degenerated intellectually. Brexiteers were frequently described as stupid by the so-called left-wing intelligentsia. And that, that's a, a popular pattern around the world, isn't it? And it doesn't help. You know, it may or may not be true, but I think putting people down before you even talk to them is is will go seriously against us and in, uh, injure us as a society. You were going to add something to that, Miguel? Yeah, I was going to say it's actually untrue uh, because in Portugal they 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 did do the um, the the sociological study on on what kind of people vote for for which party, and, oh, yeah. and for a while they were saying, oh, you know, people who vote for Shega they 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 don't have a college degree, they're all stupid and ignorant. And now we know that actually the most the people that are the the eldest and the people who are the the ones with the least education are the ones who vote for PS. And and actually Shega is is a very average party. Most people who vote for Shega do not have a, a, a high a higher degree, higher education uh, degree, um, but they do have a high school diploma. And they're not particularly old. They're not particularly young, but they're not particularly old. So it's a very middle class, very average working class uh, party. Interesting. Very interesting. Uh, if you scratch the surface, which we must, I believe. Um, does this mean something about me because I invited Shega to be interviewed on his show? I am concerned about that. I really am. You know, that went through my mind. It, it, you know, I am a sympathizer by just talking to you, according to some people. That's where we're at, isn't it? We're Guilty by association. Yes, other than the willingness to meet and hear other people's points of view, is nobody supposed to speak to labelled others. Well, here you are, the labelled other this morning, Miguel. Thank you for being here. Your guest strikes me as being exceptionally articulate and a million miles from how the left would have would have us. Oh, a fellow right-winger coming out the closet there, Doug. Um, us right-wingers described. Uh, the person who does not want to even listen to another they think they should disagree with is the dangerous one. I would agree with that. And name-calling, pointing fingers and blaming resolves nothing. Thank you, James. And open dialogue solves problems. So let's go to a few of those specific issues then that are on the political horizon. Somebody asked about, um, yes, here we go. This is a great question for you. Um, how does Shaker feel? And of course, let me reiterate, Miguel is speaking for himself as a Shaker party member. He doesn't speak for the whole party necessarily. How does Shaker feel about going cashless? And the CBDC system, I would like to roll this into an earlier question, what you meant by the regime. And do you think there is a deep state at work here in Portugal? Because people fear this, these, <laughs> these, <laughs> these agendas, such as digital banking and uh, a move away from, you know, traditional conservative values of uh, small government. CBDC is a big government thing. How does Shager feel about it? That's an excellent question I have. I haven't the faintest idea. Um, <laughs> I That's know. honest. Um, okay. I, I can tell you this. Um, as far as the as the Shega members and supporters go, uh, um, I have not seen people particularly um, uh, inclined towards accepting CBDCs and, and cashless uh, societies and fifteen minute cities and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah. we, we look at it with with enormous suspicion. I think it also has to do with the fact that we're conservatives and so we're not particularly keen on on these um, innovative uh, uh, utopian solutions. But um, I do know that Trump came out recently against CBDCs. So I would guess that that Shega and Portugal would, would follow the same path. But um, I, I'm not under leadership. I, I, I wouldn't know. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, bon dia. Great info, says Joe Diash. Uh, thank you for the interview. I'd be interested in your stance on wokeism and also on crypto taxation. Labels describe nothing. So we go from labels describe nothing to wokeism, which, of course, is a very big label. Um, people do have their knickers in a twist about wokeism. Do you, I mean, I, I'm reluctant to ask you the question that way. Um, what do you think about wokeism? Because you know we've just talked about how dangerous labels are, and that is, you know, that's just the kind of, you know, that in many ways that's lazy right wing um, rhetoric, isn't it, to attack wokeism? But I think you described it as progressive progressivism, possibly. And uh, would you care to comment on that? Yes. Well, my personal view is that, you know, during there have always been three lefts: the establishment left, the economic left, and the cultural left. Right. And you, you might remember that during the Cold War, the serious left was, you know, 
the establishment left, the, the ones in power, but also the economic left, the trade unions and the communist parties and, you know, the, the, the proletarian left, let's put it that way. And the cultural uh, left, the cultural Marxists, if you will, the, at the time they were called anarchists. And there was a great deal of condescension on the part of Leninists and socialists against uh, uh, um, left anarchists. They were saying, oh, these are just some um, mindless kids who, do, who haven't really understood uh, Das Kapital and, and the Communist Manifesto. And they don't know what they're saying. They don't know what they're doing. But let them publish the newspapers. We don't care. Um, and then it was actually those those kids, those children that that were behind the May of '68, which at the time seemed, oh well, you know, they had a demonstration. Kudos to them, but they're still not serious people. Now, fast forward a few decades, there is no more Soviet Union, and the economic left has imploded. And what do you have left? You have the establishment left, and you have the cultural left. Mm -hmm. And the problem for the establishment left is because they are part of the system, they don't have a great deal of ideological credentials. They have had to come close to the cultural left to acquire those credentials, which is why you see big multinational corporations and mainstream politicians um, adopting these woke causes because they need those credentials. Otherwise, they might be labeled capitalists. They might be labeled um, evil imperialists. But if you if you, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen the memes that if if you have these big American bombers uh, dropping bombs with a rainbow on them, then it's OK. Then then that's something that you can that you can stand for. Um, you know, it's the wow. it's the, um, the cause of the day, the cause du jour. And, and yes. therefore, it's it's now acceptable. Um, I think that's the game that is being played. Now, obviously, you know, if you ask a conservative whether he's into wokeism, you might not have a might not get a very positive answer. But um, yeah, that's, the, yeah, the, that's the problem with wokeism is not, it's not that it exists. The problem with wokeism is that it's been um, uh, um, fueled enormously by the mainstream media and by mainstream politicians, and that's why it has become as dangerous as it is. That that it it it, it propels censorship and it incentivizes. Um, cancel culture, which is basically ostracism. Um, and I, I would argue that, you know, it's tied to feminism and it's tied to a number of issues that are not particularly healthy to, to a civilized society. Okay, interesting. Well, that's kind of worms. Um, and so maybe you'll come back and maybe other politicians will to have these more nuanced and deeper conversations and, and, and awkward and uncomfortable ones as well, it has to be said. But these are un awkward and uncomfortable times. So I think we need to be having these conversations. Here's a question for you. Um, would, do you give a sort of party political view on this? Where, where does What is the, the Shager policy? Because you have become, I think, the kingmakers now. This is this is an aspiration, wasn't it? You are going to be deeply influential in the way that this parliament works out after the... Are, are all the results in now? Um, have those last few seats been counted, Miguel? No, we're still waiting on the um, on the immigration circles. Okay, so with with seventy nine seats against seventy seven, things could still change. So the president will be having a conversation. No, not so because usually Portuguese people who live abroad tend to vote right wing. Um, so, so you think AD? The question, will... the question really is whether Shega will get more MPs, not not. Not whether the Socialist Party would get more MPs. Okay, so so you no, no, in normal circumstances, no, it, it won't change. Okay, so you you will be influential. Is is the point I'm, I'm yes. trying to make? Is you know you you will you will um, you have this situation where there is this refusal. You know, we will not work with Shaker. Seems to be the uh, the um, Luis Montenegro's position, um, and maybe he'll have to, and he'll be in a, a sort of a, a, a position of uh, going to his conscience, won't he? Do I do I work with the people? I I said I won't work with for the sake of the country or, as some might read it, you know, to stay in power. And at that level, Shega will have to have a view and, and a strong one, I think, on the wars in Ukraine and Palestine. So what would you, how would you answer that question at the moment? On the wars? Yes. Uh, well, um, if you ask me for the party's uh, views, yeah. then the party is pretty clearly on the side of Ukraine and Israel. Okay. All right, anything else you want to add to that? Yeah. The official position is pro-Ukrainian, pro-Israel. 
Okay. Um, and it sounds like you might have a slightly different view yourself. Would you care to add that? There are dissenting views within the party. As, as, as there should be, I, I, I would hope, in a healthy party, which is another sign that the party may be a little bit more democratic than people think, allowing some division of opinion. Um, how, on that matter, how does she, How does this work? This is an insight into how uh, Portuguese uh, politics works. And sorry I'm all, all over the place here, because there are so many things I do want to talk to you about. But how do you manage, as you said before, you moderate extremism in your party. How does that machinery work um, on a day-to-day -day basis of the checks and balances of how Shaker is within itself before it represents itself to the country? Mm, can you be more specific? Well, I mean, how, how does how does political machinery work? Not just for you, but for any party. How how are you how are you having those conversations about where you are on the Ukraine or, or the or, or the war in Palestine? Um, how does that debate work, and then how does that influence your policy ultimately? Um, I think it just works informally. I mean, ultimately, the 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 party directory will, is the one that is going to um, uh, formulate policy. Um, at times, they they will, but I, I, you know, the thing is, because the leader and because the the, the MPs, they keep. A, a very uh, itinerant uh, lifestyle. They, they keep running up and down the country in, on elections or on, on events. They they know the pulse of the of the electorate and, and of the members of the party quite well. Um, I, I I don't think there would be any need to have, let's say, a, a direct democracy system to ascertain position. Well, what what do you as a member feel on this? Uh, is not something that is usually done. Although, um, um, well, I'm not sure if I should <laughs> uh, divulge this, but we have had recently one instance in which, via email, the party the party leadership did ask the, the members, "What do you feel about we should do about this specific yeah. situation?" Okay, all right, interesting to know. Sorry, that's but a little it's, bit of a it's not, it's not a common occurrence. No, okay, but I'm interested in, in in your internal workings there. We've got some more prosaic and mundane questions, as you, as you would as I would hope for, actually. Practical things. What is the shaker position on the IMA problem? Will there be a change in requirements for the first residency card? Are you going down to that granular level as a party yet? This is the, the, what you mentioned before about how CEF has become a different agency. There are 350,000 open cases, as I understand it. I mean, there are anything between, what, 700,000 um, upwards uh, foreigners in Portugal. It seems half of them are still a bureaucratic caseload for the new agency, which is IMA. What's, what's, how will Shaker deal with that? Or is it too early to talk about things at such a granular and practical level? Uh, Shig is categorical that we want to um, um, reintroduce or br to bring back CEF. Um, oh, okay. Right. Uh, that there, there, are, there is no um, nuance or, or doubt. Right. To make it, and, and is this again a sort of politically nuanced thing? IMA is more about asylum and a political approach, and you want it to be more of like a hard border policed approach that CEF is a security uh, agency, and it should have remained mm -hmm. so. Okay, all right. Uh, free speech says Jasmine and open dialogue. Racism is born of ignorance and fear, as said by Atticus in To Kill a Mockingbird. I think that the hegemony naturally leads to a state of fear by the majority versus the interlopers, migrants. Change can be intimidating, but with open dialogue, we build bridges and community. Thank you, Carla Miguel, for allowing this dialogue to continue. Well, thank you uh, for saying that. Um, Golden Visa says Kendall Lampkin, who was asking about uh, I'm there, NHR vanished. Will residency cards for D7 holders be next? I think we've already answered that in a sense. And uh, it's not, not only is this an important conversation today, I hope it's an, an ongoing conversation as well. Frank, I think we've uh, answered your question there. Um, Erica, maybe Shager can correct the problem that temporary residents aren't allowed to leave the country in between summer uh, and employment season. Okay, so this... As, as I've alluded to before, it's early days, isn't it, for you as a party? There are many things to be figured out before you get down to becoming involved in the law-making processes of this country. Can you give us a sense of the timescale on that and what you think is going to happen with a possible hung parliament and even another election early next year? That's a disaster for the country, isn't it, to be locked in an election and, and um, campaigning cycle rather than getting down to business, Miguel? I... 
I cannot anticipate um, because on, on one hand, I think everyone understands what the pragmatic solution would be, which is which would be to, to as make a coalition. But on the other hand, um, we've just been discussing for the past hour how the regime is not sensible and the regime is not pragmatic. And, I, you know, when, when Montenegro was elected um, as leader of PSD, I was under the impression that because he was closer to the more populist wing of PSD, that he would be more amenable to um, any sort of... Um, understandings and arrangements with Shiget. But even him has been basically forced to um, uh, an intransigent position. And, and it was, a, I, I would say, it was a, a big mistake for him to draw red lines prior to the election, especially when he wasn't even close to, to, to being, to have the hope of obtaining a an absolute majority. So now he is trapped. He's rhetorically entrapped. He's between a, a rock and a hard place. Um, and I don't know how he gets out of it. I, I, I will say this. I think it is supremely naive of him to say, and this, this was the last statement that he made on the matter, that he said, well, I hope that Shega and PS are responsible and allow us to rule. This is This is politics. This is supremely naive especially for a party whose previous prime minister was was brought down by a left-wing uh, coalition that disrespected tradition. So, you know, I, anyway, the, 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 there are certainly very good reasons and very clear reasons why people left BSD to, to found Shagan, because it, it, really those people... Now I take it from your answer, though, that this is going to remain messy, though, for, for some considerable time, and that the actual business of what you'd hope politics is about, which is running the country and making life easier for people in a way to grease the runners of society, that process is going to be bogged down in more political machinery and horse trading before you can even get down to that. Well, fortunately or not, this the Costa government did have its budget approved uh, before leaving power, before the elections. So until late in the year, Nothing will change because I, I don't see I don't see PSD trying to um, approve a new budget urgently. Uh, if they can rely on the one that is already approved, you know that that's it. So for for the next for, until the end of the year, it it, it should be very stable. Um, what happens during the spring and the summer, though, I don't know. Okay, well I think let's let's pause there. Um, I, I invite people from any party in in, in the political um, spectrum of Portugal to come and talk to us, for, largely foreigners here. We want to understand what's going on. We want to be an asset to the country. We need to understand you know, what, what might be required or expected of us um, as citizens of the country from that political point of view. So I, I, I take this moment to um, invite people from all parties to come and talk, not just the big ones, because certainly, you know, there was a massive list of people you could vote for on Sunday, and it is dominated by three parties, which is better than two, let's face it. And that's that, that's possibly the most positive thing to come from this in an old fashioned parliamentary sense, Miguel, is that there is um, the sort of uni party posing as two parties um, will now be challenged by this third force that is Shager. And clearly, um, as Pam is saying here, there's a saying uh, about knowing a man by his friends. Interesting to see the people congratulating Shager this week, which has a slightly ominous tone to it. But um, I hope that um, Shager will be that, will, will return us to that old fashioned sense of politics that we have many voices. I think Antonio uh, Barbosa was saying this in the chat earlier on. You need a lot of voices in the parliament, don't you, to come to a consensus about what might be done in society. And then people can vote on that rather than having a, a uh, what is it called, like um, an oven ready manifesto that just gets rubber stamped um, by the establishment, which seems to be what's happening. And I think that's why people are so uh, peed off with the situation and why you, your party was so popular and did so well in polling terms on Sunday. So thank you very much for being here again and answering 
um, questions from your own point of view and, and, and speaking about Shago as you've done this morning. Is there, is there a last word uh, you would like to share with us? Um, none that occurs to me. Okay, thank you enough. for having well, you, me again. You, thank you, you for the you, opportunity. Yeah, you ha you, you've a uh, great guest. Thank you both, says uh, T Duck. And my friends, what's this? Don't mean uh, same thing as judging someone by who their parents are. Yeesh. Okay, thank you for a balanced conversation, says my wife, uh, who's a little bit partial, I hope, uh, where you've given everyone a say. I look forward to more of these conversations. I'm aware that I haven't given everyone a say. There are so many questions this morning, and there were so many tangents that we were going off on that are completely understandable, um, given the subject matter. So I apologize to anyone whose question I didn't get to and points that weren't addressed, but we're here every morning, so we can return um, to this uh, conversation. Thank you, Colin Miguel, for an amazing combo. And obrigado from Joe Diaz. Thank you very much, Miguel. And um, yes, back to back to the office, then I guess. And you are you are um, I'm not. Let's not forget you you are involved in the everyday work of your local community um, as a as a, a Shaker representative in Irish. Did you say? Yes. Yep. Yeah, okay. And uh, I look forward to finding out more about the um, Trezeno work you're doing. Not least because your think tank was inspired by the example of King uh, Dom Joao II, the perfect prince and 13th king of Portugal. I think that would be an amazing history lesson to have with you one day as well. So thank you very much for the Happy time. All the very best to you. Take care. Anytime. Take care. Bye for now. Bye for now. Seems a bit weird there to um, be giving a round of applause in a political conversation there. And um, I have to say, I was nervous about doing it um, for all the reasons we've talked about, you know, this this guilty by association thing. I'm genuinely interested in all views of all politicians in Portugal. And I think the most important thing here is that we can have this conversation. Miguel made himself open and available. Um, let's see which other politicians wish to do that um, and speak for themselves and also in some to some degree, representatives of their party. Thanks for your um, for your kind words as well, and, and and hopefully understanding the situation I was in this morning, not being able to get to everything, and of course where the the, the, the political conversation gets a little bit difficult on particular issues, it's difficult to go down those avenues um, in in the in amount of time we have. But I do not in any way want to avoid them. Uh, if I ignored your question, it wasn't because I wanted to avoid it. Um, it's just the timing and situation wasn't right for the time being, so we can return to these things um, at a, another suitable time. Thank you and congrats, congratulations on the interview. Thank you, Sarah. Kendall, great guest, helped us understand. We may have Mama Bear M, Mama Bear McGowan joining us in just a moment from the countryside, which will be a balm. That'd be nice, won't it, to go from talking about uh, politics uh, into the central Portugal countryside, where, of course, you can win that beautiful off-grid home that I mentioned earlier on. So uh, I'm not sure if we'll see M Mama Bear or not. Um, saying woke, it still just means its original meaning uh, is the same as saying gay still means happy. <laughs> Interesting point there, John. And thank you, Carla Miguel from Angel Tobit as well. Let me see um, if I can go back. I didn't want to completely exhaust uh, Miguel this morning with an endless barrage of questions, but um, maybe we can go back to a few of the points that were made um, and then we can pick up on them uh, another time. Well, interestingly, it, it's interesting, isn't it, with the word woke? It is a political, it's been weaponized, let's face it. Woke simply means that you're awake and aware of something. Doesn't matter what it is. Telling someone to wake up and smell the coffee is telling them to get woke to something. Of course, I understand that, Pinky, and, and I'm sure you would accept as well. It has been weaponized, so it does mean different things to different people. Um, didn't hear the, didn't the leader, Salazar, back in the day, remain neutral during the war? Honest question, because I thought he was, asked Angel. We could have asked Miguel that. Maybe we'll ask we'll have that as a question as we approach of course um after this election here in portugal um from last sunday um with how it's going to pan out yet to be decided the next big event i think on the political landscape is the 50th celebration of the carnation revolution where of course questions like this can be answered in that context and i'll be doing my bit to help um educate inform and um support people with their interest in the uh, Carnation Revolution. How interesting it is as well, of course, that uh, we have this election where Shega do become, they've quadrupled their seats. They seem to be um, a relief valve for unexpressed and unrepresented people within the, um, within the, the, um, 
the population of Portugal. So it's interesting, isn't it? This, you know, in the way that history doesn't um, repeat itself, but it rhymes. How interesting to have a 50 year uh, rhyme here uh, after the Carnation Revolution and to have a, a new and interesting, dynamic, exciting political atmosphere in the country. A little bit of a shake up, you might say. Um, honest question there from Angel. We'll do our best to answer that as well. Um, I do not want to know what EI thinks about the outcome of elections. EI is supposed to help us in the struggle. Is that is that the migration agency? I'm not sure what you're referring to there, Kendall. Um, big astrology uh, on the carnation. <laughs> of course there is. There must be, as there is of these times. And uh, thank you for your open mind and courage. You show constantly. Come. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Great interview, Carl. Thank you, Squire, for that. Uh, the trouble with labels, yes, is that they can and often are weaponized. Just come down to this, doesn't it? And a great interview. All my family voted. Nice one by Randy. Thank you there. Not sure what you mean by that, Kendall. Um, I will, if you do want to, actually, I'll be talking to, um, what day is it? It's Tuesday, isn't it? I'll be talking to um, Daniel Reyes of Reyes and Pelicano, who of course, is the uh, legal, the law expert um, on the Dream Team sessions on a Thursday night at nine. And he is a lawyer with a great interest in constitutional matters here in Portugal. And I'm sure he'll have a lot to say as we have a conversation with him at 7.30. He's going to be uh, doing a, a legal Q&A if you've got any questions about the law here in Portugal. And specifically within conveyancing, citizenship, those are the sort of issues he deals with. He's going to be doing a special at 7.30. And I'm sure we'll be talking a little bit about the election as well at 7.30. And again, on the Dream Team session, Thursday night at 9. On the train, have to listen to the show again later. I followed just mostly just followed the comments and caught a few tidbits. Shega is a nationalist racist party, says Antonio Lorenzo Antunes. Loves foreigners and immigrants. Uh, take a look to Algarve and think on the train. I'll have to listen to the show again later. Okay, that was, uh, sorry, I'm just repeating your comment um, as you did there, Joao de Nord. Doesn't look like we're talking to M. Mama Bear McGowan, but as I said before, um, we, we've certainly had a conversation about Shager this morning. Where does that sit within the future of politics generally? To me, that is a, as equally an interesting question. Um, and um, I was hoping we might chat a little bit with Mama Bear. Cosmic as she is, with a, a, a cosmic overview, spiritual overview, if you like, of us human beings in this time of our historical evolution. Where are we going to go? Uh, are we just going to keep going around in these uh, political circles that don't seem to be working especially well? Or is there a new future um, that uh, we might determine be part of influence? I missed that question, Owen. I'll get. It. I'll ask him next time. What he th I think we you, you got a general idea of where he stood um, with um, the big government, global government sort of matters, which which is where I would file that question there on the World Economic Forum. Certainly, um, some some um, organisations have a view for the future of humanity and a great big collective one world globalist view of it. What else might we do? That's an, another important part, I think, of the contextual conversation around politics. Thank you very much for being here this morning. Um, a couple more then, as you are the nought, uh, because it does. I know people much older than me who, who still use gay to describe events. They went to forever ago, lol. Thanks, Pinky. Yes, the migration agency. The word on the street was IMA was supposed to free up after the election. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, I thought you meant EI, uh, Gilda's company there. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I, I, my, my answer to that, Kendall, as, as I was trying to articulate with, um, with Miguel, and I wonder what he thought about it, they've got their hands full figuring out what might be a hung parliament and how they're going to work together before they change any law. That's going to be months away. There might be another election, as, as we're hearing in some parts of the, the political discussion early next year. It's still quite messy from how the government's going to work, let alone make law and make things work any any more smoothly on a practical level. With the real, well, I know you got you know there are real issues to be dealt with by people who are struggling to get residency cards and renewals and that sort of thing. But I think the politicians are somewhere else at the moment, figuring out how and whether they've got jobs and how they're going to work with each other before they address these matters and before they bring in any law to make things 
um, work any better. I appreciate how discussions like this has expose a lot of ignorance uh, in the community, as well as says T-Duck. Um, as in the event was so much fun and everyone was happy and gay. Um, exactly my point, Jardin says, it still does. And it means so much more as well. So there we go. We've opened a few uh, cans of worms, I think. Uh, this morning as well as had that chat with Miguel and long may that continue um, open-minded balanced discussion as best as I'm able here on the good morning porch show thank you very much for being here this morning and we'll see you again tomorrow for ask anything about Portugal Wednesday I will see you then Heather's with us and Paul Reese um, is with us tomorrow so uh, have a good day and uh, keep in the conversation like as I said my final my final note then um, yeah, get on with it, Carl, is, you, you know, I think it's so important where, where we have a, a conflict, let's have a conversation. And when we have a division, uh, let's have discourse. Have a great day. Bye for now. <laughs>